All right, now let's move on to waves. So we'll pick up where we left off last time. Uh, I did spend a little bit of time talking about oscillations. And one of the things I mentioned with oscillations is that uh, you can create waves, you can have uh, things oscillating at particular speeds. I talked about the fact that when you have something oscillating, you can have complex uh, arguments. So you, you can have some oscillating function, sine of omega t, and this can be a complex number, which gives you different behavior. So I'm going to go back to that uh, a little bit right now. And then we're going to explore the consequences of this in the wave equation in a bunch of different scenarios. So the equation that describes uh, the equation that describes how something oscillates is that the acceleration that it has. So you have mass times acceleration x double dot. And one thing that I didn't, I haven't said, but I probably should have said, is that this a dot that's a time derivative. So it's how something varies with time. So this would, if x is position, then x dot is velocity, and x double dot is acceleration. And we have this thing where it was, so the mass times the acceleration, that's Newton's second law, is equal to the sum of the forces. Um, and the, for, the different forces that we have available to us are like the spring force. There's this minus kx, so that's a, that's a force. We also have the resistance force, or like the drag force, that's minus vv. And then we could also imagine having some external force that uh, is just some function of time or some other force that's pushing things around. Uh, we'll ignore this for now, but um, you could have that. So if I move all these things to the other side, um, now this is velocity right here. Uh, velocity is also equal to the time derivative of position. So when I write this all out, I get mx double dot um, plus b times x dot plus kx equals zero. Now, what, this, what does this say? What this says is that whatever x happens to be, so x is the position, whatever the position of this wave happens to be as a function of time, um, so we're looking for x of t, that would be the solution to this equation. Whatever it happens to be as a function of time, um, it has to be, the acceleration has to be proportional to the velocity and to the position, right? Because this is saying, well, let's take, for example, if we ignore any friction. So if we, if we ignore that term, we're going to get something that looks like this. mx double dot equals minus kx. Right, I subtract it back over. This says that the second derivative of an object has to be proportional to, is proportional to the position. So the curvature of the thing is proportional to the position. The set Or the second derivative is proportional to the original function itself. There's only one class of functions whose derivatives are proportional to themselves. If we ignore the spring force, if we say, okay, so there's no spring force, there's only friction. If there's only friction, then we get mx double dot equals uh, minus bx dot. Okay, this says that the acceleration is proportional to the velocity. Well, there's only one kind of function whose derivatives are proportional to each other, and those are exponential functions. So e to the something. So x equals e to the something. These are the only functions that are proportional to their own derivatives. So uh, what does that tell us? Well, the, act, the general solution to this is going to be that x is going to be equal to some exponential function um, as a function of time, e to, the, e to the t, or it could be e to the minus t. These are t's, by the way, not, not plus signs. Um, and then you're going to have coefficients out front to compare them. And there's going to be something stuck up here at the top as well. So it's actually going to be x equals a e to the what, like alpha t um, plus b e to the minus alpha t. And this alpha or beta, beta t, something like this. Um, and they, they could be the same. They could be, there's a series of functions that can all satisfy this equation. Um, but these things are going to be complex variables. And because they are complex, because you know we're talking about functions that are proportional to their own derivatives, so that's like exponential growth. The, the growth of something is proportional to the size of that object. The growth of the population of rabbits is proportional to the number of rabbits that you have. Uh, that's exponential growth. But this, because this can be a complex number, that means that you're going to get complex values up there. You're going to have some function e to the a plus bi all times, all times t. This should have been here. And so this part is going to oscillate. 
because when you exponentiate a complex number, you get oscillations, you get sine functions. And uh, this part here is going to be an exponential decay or an exponential growth. And so that's basically, um, that, that's what this equation tells us. This equation that mass times acceleration, so that's Newton's second law. Um, and then we're going to add to it the friction force, uh, and we're going to add to it the spring force is equal to either zero or some other function. But this is saying that all the derivatives are proportional to each other, which means that it has to be an exponential, but it's an exponential with a complex argument, which means that you can get oscillatory behavior or you can get growth or decay behavior from it. But that's kind of interesting, just to note that there's only one class of functions who are proportional to their own derivatives. And so there's only one class of functions that can satisfy this equation. Um, another thing that we can consider is suppose, so this is the wave equation, uh, will give us, well, let's take a look at the physics of a wave, in particular looking at a wave on a string. So here's a wave on a string. And what we're looking at is what is the acceleration of a particular point on that string. So here are a bunch of different points on the string. This thing's going to accelerate that way. This one's going to accelerate that way. This thing here might just stay stationary, you know, if, we, if it's a node, so it's oscillating around that particular height. Okay, so here's the wave. And all these different points, the acceleration has to be the biggest up here, and it goes to zero there. There's no acceleration at this point because it's just stationary. That the little piece of string that's right here is going to stay fixed. The piece of string that's up here is going to, of necessity, accelerate the most as it goes back and forth um, as this thing is oscillating. Okay, so here's this thing oscillating going back and forth, uh, which is what going back and forth means. And uh, the acceleration has to be the biggest there. Another thing that is happening there is that the curvature of this uh, of the function is greatest there. That's where it's turning over the most. Here at this point, there's no curvature at all. Um, and to some extent, this is also a question of what's your reference frame, right? The fact that this is coming through this point at a line there, um, that line has slope because we've chosen our coordinate system to look like this. You can imagine rotating your coordinate system that looks like that. And then this is that line at that instant in time, that line is just sitting there. There's no there's nothing to cause an acceleration because this line is um, it's a line. There's, there's nothing pulling in one direction more than it is in pulling in another direction. Where here, for example, at this point, you've got the string on this side pulling this way and the string on this side pulling this way, and a portion of that tension will cancel, but a portion of it will add. And it's the portion that adds that causes this thing to accelerate. So the curvature is proportional to the acceleration. Hmm, so the curvature at a given point uh, tells you what the acceleration at that point will be. Well, let me write down an equation that says that the curvature squiggles the acceleration. The curvature is two, um, let's see, let's go with y. So that is the curvature, the second derivative of y with respect to x in this direction. It squiggles, so it's going to be proportional to, there's going to be some constant of proportionality out front, and then it's proportional to the acceleration. The curvature gives you the acceleration. So that's going to be d squared y dt squared. This is the wave equation. The wave equation says that the curvature of whatever your medium happens to be, or whatever your whatever the force is that is inducing the wave, um, the curvature of that is what gives you uh, drives the acceleration of that wave. So that is, um, that's all the wave equation says. So anything that satisfies this is a wave by definition. And there are a variety of different ways to satisfy this. You don't have to satisfy it just with sine waves. This equation you can satisfy um, with a variety of different structures. It's just that the second derivative of the spatial coordinate is going to, has to equal the second derivative of the time coordinate up to a proportionality constant. So these two things squiggle each other. So for a wave in a string, it's the tension that causes this. For a sound wave, it's the pressure buildup that you have. So if you have a sound wave going through a room, you're going to have a region where things are more spread apart, and you're going to have regions where things are more close together. So here's a sound wave. You have a bunch of stuff here that's piled up, and then it's more rarefied over here, and then it piles up again, and then it's more rarefied, and then it piles up again. 
Okay, and so this is a pressure wave. You're you have some mechanism of transfer transferring information from one place to another, um, whether it's through a force or tension in a string or whether it's through pressure. Because uh, remember that tension in a string is a one-dimensional version of pressure. Um, the three-dimensional version of pressure would be like gas pressure or whatever. Uh, and this stuff is going to compress and then it's going to re-expand or rarefy. And then you would say, okay, what is the pressure at some location? And you plot pressure as a function of position and you're going to get this wave. Okay, so those correspond to each other. The rarefied things correspond to each other here. And there's going to be some equilibrium about which those pressure variations are going to occur. Um, so that, that's what a sound wave looks like. Okay, so waves in a string, sound waves here. You can have waves uh, in water, for example. Fluids can have waves both through the water, in which case that's also a pressure wave, or you can have waves along the surface of the water at a boundary between two fluids. You can have uh, waves that travel along the surface. So if you look at water, at the air-water interface, um, you can have waves uh, going across the air-water interface. So if it's air up here, uh, air with an R instead of with a G, air, uh, and water down here. Here is oh, the surface that divides the two. If there's no surface, if there's no boundary between these two fluids, then you can't actually have this kind of wave. It's, this is a shear wave where the restoring force is perpendicular to the motion of the wave. There, what is it that's restoring the wave right here? Well, the thing that it depends. There are two different forces that are acting on water waves. There are gravitational forces, so you have this bump in the water and gravity is going to pull it downwards. And you have this one down here, and because it's got a smaller force on it, it's going to, relatively speaking, going to go upwards. So gravity is the restoring force in one instance, but water also has surface tension. Because water has surface tension, you can also have, uh, there's essentially a tension along the surface, which is what surface tension means. It's funny how I got that one figured out. Uh, that tension across the surface acts like a spring, and it pulls things back up um, through the molecular interactions of the different water molecules. So surface tension can also cause um, waves or can also act as the restoring force um, as the surface gets distorted and then it gets restored through this restoring force that restoring force can either be gravity in which point you call it a gravity wave or it's through the surface tension okay the, the water trying to snap itself back into a flat configuration through the surface tension surface tension would be called a capillary wave Uh, capillary, one R, two L's, uh, capillary wave. So there are two different types of waves that can propagate through water. There's a gravity wave where gravity is the restoring force, and there's a capillary wave where it's the surface tension that's the restoring force. Any fluid that has a surface tension and that's working in a gravitational field can exhibit both of these types of waves. If you have a surface that has no surface tension, if you have a fluid with no surface tension, then you can only have gravity waves. There's no capillary waves. Now, the... Uh, yes, all of these VODs are also on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. So one thing to point out here is that these gravity waves are not the same kind of gravity waves that are detected by LIGO. These aren't in spiraling black hole type gravity waves. And so when you're talking to someone with about, if you're talking with a technical person, so a scientist who specifically studies gravitational waves with LIGO, like in spiraling black holes, they won't call them gravi gravity waves. They will call them gravitational radiation uh, because that separates them from gravity waves where gravity waves are the strong force. Personally, I think the context is so different between the two that they might as well use gravity waves because it rolls off the tongue better than gravitational radiation. Right? It, that's five more syllables to say the same thing. Um, it's okay to have multiple definitions if the context is sufficient to distinguish them. But nevertheless, uh, you'll often hear people say you know, gravitational radiation instead of gravity waves uh, because these water waves Gravity is something that restores it, and under those conditions, then the term is a gravity wave. Uh, let's see. The uh, gravity waves. So a few other things that are interesting about the difference between gravity waves and capillary waves is that waves of different wavelengths propagate at different rates through water. So if you're talking about the surface of a water, 
So here's the surface of water. If you have a wave that's traveling along the surface of water like this, that's got that wavelength, and you have a second wave across the surface of the water that travels, that has this wavelength, right? Because it's an infinite sheet of an infinite surface, and so you can have wavelengths of any variety uh, on the surface of the water. If gravity is the restoring force, then these waves, I think it's these ones that travel more rapidly and these ones travel more slowly. Does that sound right? I think that's right. Um, so water waves propagate at some rate that's proportional to the restoring force, which is in this case is gravity. And the larger the wavelength of the wave that is propagating, the faster it will move. And the shorter the wavelength, the slower it will move under the effects of gravity. The fact that they are different is called a dispersion relation. Dispersion relation. Uh, there's an I in there. There. The dispersion relation is how do wavelengths of different waves propagate through a given medium. So it's a property of the medium, in this case the surface of the water. And it's got, uh, I think this is called normal dispersion. The longer wavelengths travel faster than the shorter wavelengths. Uh, capillary waves, on the other hand, that are restored through surface tension, the shorter wavelength one actually propagates faster than the long wavelength ones. And so that's reverse dispersion. There's some other term for it that's backwards dispersion. Uh, so when you look at water waves, you actually get a weird effect where because the ripples or because the waves of different wavelengths travel at different speeds, water waves look like they kind of appear and disappear uh, as they travel by. So you'll have this kind of disturbance passing along the water. So here is your the disturbance moving. It will look like this. Here's the disturbance moving to the right. And you'll have ripples within that disturbance move from behind it to the front. So the ripples will propagate through the disturbance even as this disturbance itself is moving. So the disturbance will move at some rate and the ripples will pass through it faster than the movement of the ripple itself, like the whole ensemble of waves. Um, and so there's a video that I will steal from the internet to show this. Uh, it is water, water waves, um, water waves, dispersion, dispersion relation. And there's a video that I typically watch in my classes. Um, that is not it. And of course it always shows up like on my fourth time trying to... Hmm, well, let's, let's try this one. No, let's not do that one. Okay, water wave dispersion relation pond. Pond. Here we go. Ripples in a pond. Okay, ripples in a pond, dot, dot, dot. Oh, they didn't have the dot, dot, dot. But if there were dot, dot, dots, then that would be where it shows up. When a small object is dropped in calm water, two types of waves are formed. This is very poetic, especially if you pronounce it properly. Okay, now look. So small capillary waves visible at the leading edge of the ripple. So here's the ripple, and you've got gravity waves in the back, back here, and you've got capillary waves in the front. So these are the ones restored by... Um, the surface tension. Notice that the capillary waves, if you can see the shadow of the capillary waves back uh, down here. Can I, is this showing up? My, yeah, okay, my pointer is showing up right here. You can see the, the shadow of the capillary waves, how they're closer together at the front and farther apart at the back. Okay, that means that the shorter wavelengths, so you have this disturbance, it excites all varieties of wavelengths. So disturbance happens, uh, at this given instance, the water, the rock falls into the water, boom. So you have, like, here's the situation. You have this sudden um, disturbance. You, this is going to produce all varieties of wavelengths. So all these varieties of wavelengths are going to come out of this uh, disturbance all at once. The thing hits the water. It creates a, a shock that has all wavelengths in it that is going to propagate outwards. The capillary waves, the shorter wavelengths is going to move the fastest. So the shorter wavelength moves the fastest, and so that's out in front, because it's all coming from the same original location. The shorter wavelengths are moving the fastest with the capillary waves, so they go out front. The longer wavelength capillary waves are trailing behind. They don't spread out as fast. 
The opposite is true for the other one. So you'll notice that the larger ripples here, that this wavelength there, separating those two, is bigger than this one here. The separation between the first big circle and the second one is larger than the one between the second one and the third one. That tells you that the longer wavelength ripples are traveling faster for the gravity waves and the shorter ones um, are for the capillary waves. So we will continue on and it's going to, um, the larger gravity waves that follow them These gravity waves exhibit what is known as normal dispersion. The longer wavelengths move faster towards the front of the group. So you can see here again that that separation that's shown here is bigger for that one than it is for the one behind it. So the longer wavelengths moved out faster from this disturbance. The shorter wavelength is the one that's behind it. Let me speed this up a bit. Shorter ones in the back, so there you go. Uh, the phase speed is faster than the group speed, so individual waves appear at the back of the group and catch up to the front. And so the disturbance travels at a rate that's different than the individual waves. So, and what he points out here is that you can see how the waves will start in the center and move to the front and then disappear. The waves, an individual ripple will start in the center and move to the, to the outer edge and then disappear as other ones catch up to it. So that's kind of cool. Um, anomalous dispersion, that's the other thing. Capillary waves show anomalous dispersion. Shorter ones are in the front and longer ones are in the back. You can see it best in the shadow. Um, of course, I, all this stuff I stole from this um, thing here. Right, so you can see it there that the shorter wavelengths are here and the longer wavelengths are in the back. There you go. That is uh, dispersion relation and capillary waves when it comes to these kinds of just, um, images. And you can see it here as well, right? You can see that the it's a longer wavelength here, and then it gets shorter and shorter and shorter as you go towards the splash in the center of this puddle. Let's see, shallow water equations, some of the most beautiful equations in science. Uh, I don't know why this tremor happens twice. Okay, so that uh, water waves. So all these different things, waves, it's the curvature of the force that is um, acting as the restoring force to the wave that gives you the acceleration. Uh, or it's the curvature of the force transmitting substance, so whether it's pressure that uh, gives you the force or whether it's tension in the spring that gives you the force or whether it's surface tension that gives you the force or whether it's gravity that gives you the force. It's that curvature um, that tells you how quickly the thing wiggles. And that's basically the wave equation. Okay, now a few other things. If you have a continuous uh, object, so it goes on forever, then you can send any wave that you want down this object. It can be a short wavelength, it can be a really long wavelength. There's nothing preventing it from having any wave that you want to have available. Okay, however, if you tie off the ends, then you start restricting its motion. Okay, if you tie off one end, you can still have any, a half integer or a half infinite uh, string, for example, or pressure medium, uh, can also have any wavelength in it. It can have short wavelengths and long wavelengths with no restriction. But if you pinch off both ends, then you're all of a sudden restricting what waves can fit in this container. If you pinch off both ends and you force them to have certain behaviors, so they have certain boundary conditions, then the waves that can satisfy those boundary conditions are now limited. Uh, basically the idea is you have this wave equation, it gives you a couple degrees of freedom that you can have for initial conditions, and when you fix the boundaries, then those initial conditions are soaked up. Uh, you no longer have them as free parameters, and in fact, uh, they are fixed by the boundary conditions. Um, yeah, tie off, if I tie this off, for example, if I have a wall here, or I stake it to the ground, or I have someone standing there holding the end, it's like a jump rope, for example, um, so if it's an infinitely long thing, that's, then you have freedom to be whatever you want. But as soon as you bind it together, then or you bind the ends, or you force certain boundary conditions, then you've restricted the waves that can fit in here. So you can have that wave, you can have a wave that looks like this, you can have a wave that looks like this, 
um, or any number of bumps as long as the boundary conditions are satisfied. Now, the boundary conditions don't necessarily mean that it has to be fixed. You can have a boundary condition that is allowed to flop around freely, um, but you still have within a given region, you're still going to have certain waves that are allowed and other waves that are not allowed. So for example, you can force the boundary to stay fixed or you can force the boundary to, um, to be able to slide up and down. So the way that that's usually depicted is, is like this. So here is a, a ring that's able to slide up and down on this pole. So here's the pole right there. You can have a ring and it can slide up and down without friction. And as a consequence, this is not fixed. It's deliberately not fixed. So this is gonna be able to move up and down at will um, where this other end might be fixed okay and so that's a different type of boundary condition but it is still a condition that is forced to be satisfied by the nature of the mechanical properties at the end of that uh, wave okay and again this is on a string you can have it it doesn't have to be on a string it can be sound waves as well like pressure waves in a gas medium they have the same kind of boundary conditions so as soon as you fix the boundaries then you are restricting the kinds of waves that can travel. So what, or if we go back to this idea before, now we have this tower of possible waves. Okay, they, I did it backwards, but um, so this would be like the ground state energy, this is first excited state, second excited state, uh, which is what are the kinds of waves that can fit in a box that has these boundary conditions. Okay, so uh, Along these lines, this is actually similar to what you can have with virtual particles. So people talk in quantum mechanics a lot about, oh, these are virtual photons that, that can exist, but um, you know they pop in and out of existence, but uh, they don't last very long. Virtual particles in this context would be all the particles that cannot persist, cannot be observed, the particles that can't be observed, or in other words, the waves, the waveforms that cannot be observed with these boundary conditions. So in this case, we have, these are the waveforms that can be observed given those boundary conditions, but you could have a wave that is like this, like one and a half wavelengths or three quarters of a wavelength in, the, in that boundary. And this is not observed. So it's something that can't be observed in real life, but it is in principle a wave that could be there. This would be like a virtual particle. So in quantum mechanics, we talk about real particles and virtual particles. The real particles are all the waves, are all the particles that you can actually observe, you can see them, and the virtual particles are ones that can pop in and out of existence on really, really short time scales as long as it satisfies the uncertainty principle. Um, but they are not able to materialize in, in our detectors. We can't detect them. And so that's uh, another way of thinking about real particles and virtual particles is uh, ones that satisfy the boundary conditions and therefore can be can actually exist and ones that don't satisfy the boundary conditions and in which case are ephemeral they can show up and then disappear uh, as long as what would it be in this case it's as long as it satisfies the uncertainty principle which if I were to guess this is a complete guess at what that would entail in this kind of situation it would be as long as they don't exist for a time that's equivalent to the travel time of the wave across the um, across the system so this is going to travel across the system at some at some speed. And so this virtual particle cannot exist in this system for time scales longer than the time that it takes for the wave to propagate from one end of this to the other. So that's the equivalent of the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle before particles stand in a box, like particles trapped or waves, waveforms trapped in a fixed container. So basically what that means is suppose you have a jump rope that's attached to a wall. So here's this and you're wiggling this end. You're wiggling this end uh, with small amplitude wiggles and so um, we're not worried about the displacement of this end. You can wiggle this at a given wavelength like that but uh, and that wavelength can exist in the string up to the point where it hits this wall and then the wall forces the boundary condition and so it causes these things that don't fit into the box to dissipate very quickly. So you can pop it into existence by wiggling it at a certain weight, but a certain uh, frequency, but if that frequency doesn't satisfy the boundary conditions, then it will disappear uh, very quickly. Uh, here, thank you for that uh, sub, I appreciate it. Let's see, here's a question. In quantum mechanics, you could pinch off the universe from the Big Bang to a black hole. Uh, 
yes. Um, if you had, if you have a closed universe, then you can say, all right, here's a universe. I have this boundary condition over here, and I have another boundary condition on the far side, and therefore everything that happens in here has got to be some multiple of the, you know, it's got to be some wavelength that fits into that box. Um, it's a really big box, and so you've got a lot of time to work with. So that is something that's true. Uh, probably a better example of this in the early universe is that in the early universe you have the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is at some time here, and you have the universe is hot. It's a hot plasma, so you've got the charges separated from each other. When you have a plasma, the photons can't escape. So here's a plasma, you have a bunch of charged particles like this. So these are positive and negative charged particles, electrons and the protons basically separated from each other because the universe is hot, and so the, the electrons can't bind to form neutral atoms. And you have photons that are bouncing around in this mix, because that's what photons do. But because photons, there's no boundary conditions for where the photons have to live, they're bouncing off of everything, and the universe is opaque. Okay, plasmas are opaque. Lightning bolts are opaque. You can't see through them. So that means that the photons can only diffuse from one spot to another. So the photons are coupled to the plasma. The time that it takes for a photon to go from the center of the sun to the surface of the sun, so one solar radius, uh, the time it takes for photons to diffuse one solar radius is about um, 500,000 years. Okay, The early universe was hot plasma like this, and it was also um, and as a consequence, the, the photons were diffusing outwards, or diffusing around from one point to another. And at around 500,000 years, it's actually 380,000 years, but that's like 500,000 years. Um, so around the time that the universe expanded and cooled by this amount of time, at that point, the electrons are able to combine with the protons, become neutral atoms, and the photons are free to escape. So you have this lightning bolt type early universe with photons that are trapped. They can only move really short distances, right? 500,000 years, it takes eight minutes for the light to go from the surface of the sun to us. It takes 500,000 years to go from the center of the sun to the surface of the sun, which is like 1%, less than 1% of the distance from the sun to us. Um, and so the early universe is the same way. It was opaque and so the light is diffusing very slowly from one place to another. And then it reaches some threshold at 500,000 years. It's Like I said, it's 380,000 years, but we're going to use the analogy here. At 500,000 years, now all of a sudden the photons are able to stream in all directions uh, from that area. So the photons were trapped there, and then as soon as the boundary was, uh, as soon as they were liberated, the optical depth dropped down, then they streamed freely. Well, because the photons are in here early on, you have sound waves that are bouncing around. You have this plasma has sound propagating through it at certain um, speeds. So the sound waves are bouncing around in the early universe, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. And this thing at 500,000 years pinches off like your box. Now you have a period of time where waves can propagate from the early universe to some point in time. Waves can propagate, and the waves that propagate are ones that fit into this box. Okay, so these are the only waves that will fit in there, or those are the ones that are preferred to fit in there. And those correspond to, so those are sound waves. Uh, you have the same idea, sound waves are propagating through this box. You, uh, the box establishes a boundary condition through some other ph physical mechanism, right? In this case, it's the optical depth changing. And so that, pref that selects preferentially certain wavelengths of sound waves propagating through there. So now you have certain wavelengths that can exist in real life and they didn't disappear uh, as a consequence of not satisfying the boundary conditions. And so this corresponds to high pressure and low pressure regions, which means high temperature and low temperature regions. And so now you're going to get bumps, um, temperature bumps uh, that are bigger, like higher temperatures, or higher differences in temperature at certain wavelengths and lower differences in temperature at wavelengths that don't fit in the box. Okay, so you're going to get a peak that corresponds to the fundamental mode and you're going to get another peak in how many bright spots do you get, like what, what's the intensity of the bright and dark spots 
you get another peak that corresponds to two bumps in it, another peak that corresponds to three bumps in it, and so forth. This is called the power spectrum. And so if you look at um, the cosmic microwave background, so this is the cosmic microwave background. It looketh like this. Go away. Cosmic microwave background looks like this. You have these hot spots and cold spots. Those hot spots and cold spots correspond to the pressure uh, hot spot or like the high pressure and low pressure regions in those waves that were selected by this physical process. And if you look at the power spectrum, which is what is the relative intensity of different wavelengths, you get, lo and behold, these very bumps. So that's the fundamental mode at like half a wavelength fitting into that uh, propagation. It's a half a wavelength that fits into that propagation time. And then here's twice that speed and three times the speed and four times and five times and so forth. So those are the bumps that correspond to these different waves that fit into the early universe from sound waves bouncing back and forth. And when you have this boundary condition that gets established, then that fixes which ones can materialize in, uh, in the world. All right, so that's uh, an example of sound waves propagating through something that has boundary conditions. Uh, the waves on a string is the easiest one to visualize because people love guitars and they love jump rope. Uh, does the non-commutative nature of the Lorentz force enable intergalactic travel? No, it does not. Okay, so those are examples of sound waves. Let's take a look uh, more carefully at these different kinds of waves waves that can propagate in different strings. So if you have a stringed instrument, uh, like a, a guitar, then you can have these waves that are propagating because both ends are fixed on the guitar. You have the neck and the bridge. Both ends are fixed. This is going to be the fundamental mode. You're going to have all the harmonics that can fit, which is the number of bumps that can fit in here, all these different harmonics. Um, and those harmonics, when you pluck a string, all of these harmonics are going to be excited depending upon how you pluck the string. You can pluck a string so that it oscillates primarily in the fundamental mode. But typically when you play a guitar, you don't strum the guitar here in the center. You strum the guitar over here on the end. And a, a consequence of that is that you'll excite all these different waves, right? If you'll excite any wave that can be stretched um, at, that, uh, at that location. If you, there happens to be a wave where that's a node, you know, say that you have a wave that looks like this, and where you're plucking the string from is a node, then you won't excite that wave. That wave will not exist, um, but all these other ones will. And so when you play a guitar, where you strum the strings on the guitar will actually change the timbre, timbre, the timbre of the guitar, which is like the sound that the distinctive sound that the guitar makes is the timbre. And so when you, if you pluck the strings in the middle of the guitar, you'll get certain sounds. If you pluck it at the end of the guitar, you'll excite different, the relative excitement of these different waves will be different. And so you can change the sound of it. I have a guitar here, but I, I'm not, uh, I don't necessarily want to pull it out at this moment. Um, so if you strum the string right at the very edge of the bridge, then you get really kind of high pitched timbre because it's harder to excite the fundamental modes, the longer wavelength modes, and it's easier to excite all the small ones that are here at the end. Um, where if you strum it in the middle, then you'll get kind of deeper sounds. Uh, you can also force the system to oscillate with certain frequencies. So when you play guitars, when you play harmonics like Red Barchetta from Rush, Red Barchetta from Rush is a very famous song because everybody loves Rush. Uh, at the beginning of the song, he's playing a bunch of harmonics. Do, 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 do. Those, what he's doing is he's not actually plucking the string to get it to vibrate in all possible modes. He has his guitar string like this. Uh, he ha here's his guitar string. And he's placing his finger on the guitar string here without pressing it all the way to the fretboard. He's putting his finger on the guitar string so that the whole string can still vibrate, except it's not able to vibrate where his finger is located. So here's Alex Lifeson's finger is right there. And so this is going to allow any wavelength that fits, that satisfies the boundary conditions, including 
this boundary condition that the string cannot vibrate at that location. Okay, if he put his finger here, so here is his finger in this location, then that would mean that the string could vibrate like this, okay, where it's not able to vibrate there, but whatever else fits, will it, you're able to do it. So as you, there are different locations on the string where you can you lightly touch it. You're not actually changing the length of the string. When you press the string all the way to the fretboard, so here's your guitar, okay, and you have a fret right there. If you press your finger all the way to the fretboard, then you've actually just changed the length of the string. And so, yeah, you're going to get different sounds because it's going to oscillate at different rates, but that's not what's going on here because notice that there's oscillation happening over here. So this is just lightly pressing your finger on it to prevent the string from vibrating at that location. And as a consequence, you're sampling or you're picking out the harm, only the harmonics that can oscillate at that length. So, um, so th those are, anyways, those are the harmonics. Uh, you can also do artificial harmonics. I don't totally know the physics of artificial harmonics. What I think you're doing when you when you pick artificial harmonics, any guitar players would know this. You you pluck the string with a pick and then you hit it with your thumb, um, and it basically, after the string starts vibrating, then you, so you pluck it, it vibrates in all different modes, and then you hit it with your thumb to quench certain modes and allow other modes to propagate. And so you get artificial harmonics. So it's not natural harmonics like these ones. It's an artificial harmonic that you add to the string or that you force on the string by plucking it, which excites all modes. And then you tap it with your, the fleshy part of your thumb to damp out certain modes. And that leaves behind a residue of certain um, harmonics that give that change the timbre of the instrument. Uh, you can go on a string to get uh, specific intervals to generate different harmonics. Yes, and so what you'll get, like a bugle, for example. So this is a stringed instrument, but uh, wind instruments have the same effect. Wind instruments have a different uh, boundary condition. So a typical wind instrument will look like this. Well, there's there's different kinds of wind instruments. So uh, if we look at uh, what do we want to look at? Let's look at a trumpet, for example. So a trumpet is going to basically be a pipe that looks like this. Okay, and the waves that fit in this pipe, because here the pressure has to match everywhere. So you have atmospheric pressure out here and on the other side. And so what you're going to get is waves, the waves that fit into this pipe look like this. Okay, or you can have something that looks like that. Okay, so the, those are both kind of ugly, so let me go back to just this one. So you'll notice that here, whoops, here you have maximum oscillation at this point, and it's actually oscillations going this way and that way that's happening here. And the same thing is true here. So you have two free ends that are able to oscillate, and your node actually lines up here in the middle. So this is what happens when you have a brass instrument, is that you're buzzing here, so you're exciting oscillations here, and you're getting oscillations at the far side of this, and there's no oscillation in the center. Um, when you go to the next highest harmonic, so if I draw the next highest harmonic on this particular instrument, you're going to have something that looks like that. Okay. Okay, so again, you get oscillations here, oscillations here, and you have two nodes instead of just one. And then the next one will have three nodes instead of two. So the sound interval between this one and this one uh, in this case, that's not an octave. Um, so the sound interval here is, right, this is half a wavelength and this is one and a half wavelength. So that's going to be a fifth, I think. I think that's a fifth. But these are the intervals that you have in a bugle. So a bugle is a trumpet uh, with no valves. So here's a bugle. It's a trumpet with no valves. And so the bugle calls that you hear when you go to the races or when you're in the army and you hear all the things, it's only able to go through certain intervals. So all bugle calls have certain intervals that are available to them and not others. And so all bugle calls are gonna have these intervals. The next one up will have three nodes in it. So it'll look something like that. Maybe that's, that looks like four. So that's, I skipped one here on accident. Um, anyway, so these different intervals are what are going to be in your bugle call, and they're, all bugle calls are going to have those same intervals because there's no, you can't fit any other wavelengths in there. So there's no other notes that you can play besides the ones that fit into the box. 
um, the way that you work around this, let's say that you want to play all notes in the scale and not just bugle calls, then what you have to do is you have to add new lengths of pipe. So here's another length of pipe that changes this length and therefore allows different wavelengths. And then you have buttons that you can push that divert the air through those different wavelengths of, or through those different lengths of pipe. So an, an actual trumpet is, um, whoops, if you look at the cross section of the trumpet, it looks like this. That's with all the valves, what, open or closed. I guess they're closed and then you open them when you push them down. Maybe they're, I don't know how, I guess maybe when they're all open, then it's open and then you close them when you push them down. I don't, I don't know. So anyways, it works. Uh, it works like that. Uh, but then when you push down one of the, or when you open up one of the valves, now all of a sudden your trumpet is longer. And so certain, a certain tower of wavelengths will fit in this trumpet and a different tower of wavelengths will fit in that trumpet. And then you have two valves down, which makes it even longer or two valves open, which makes it even longer. And so you get a different tower of notes to go that fit in that one. And so if you want to play a bunch of different notes with your trumpet, you have to keep changing the length of the tube so that you can get a different set of available notes to you. And then you buzz your lips at the speed that excites one mode over a different one. So you preferentially excite one mode uh, and with your lips, and then you make that the trumpet resonate. You excite the air in the tube so that it will resonate at that uh, frequency. So you, you pick the length of the tube that can that allows the wave to oscillate at that frequency. And then uh, as long as you're close to it, then you'll excite it. The better the tone is, the, the closer your lips buzz to that frequency, the better the tone will be. Um, but then the length of the pipe is what's going to determine whether that note can actually be played or not. So thank you for that sub. I appreciate it. So that's what's going on um, with a trumpet. Uh, if you, uh, the same thing is true with uh, flute, except flute is a little bit different, um, and clarinets uh, are also different, oboes are different uh, slightly in terms of how much the wave can oscillate at this end compared to oscillating at this end. So a flute is basically op uh, closed at one end and open at the other. I think clarinets are a better example where you don't, um, the excitement that you get from the reed buzzing it's as though this is a pinched off end and it opens up here and so you get every other harmonic uh, anyways so you get a different timbre for each instrument that you play based upon the relative ease with which these different modes can be excited the higher modes if it's hard to excite certain modes then they're going to be damped down and if it's easy to excite in certain modes then they're going to be amplified and so when you play a note on a particular instrument the way you can distinguish one type of instrument from another is what are the relative amplitudes of the fundamental mode compared to this wavelength, compared to this wavelength. Maybe some instruments, this one is really easy to play, this one is also really easy to play, but this one's really hard to play, uh, like it's not excited by a particular vibration. And so this one will be quieter, this note will be quieter than these other ones. And so the mixture of these two with a little bit of this one gives you one kind of sound for the instrument compared to um, if they were all equally well excited. Uh, that's also, you can, there's a slight difference between the timbre of a coronet and a trumpet, even though the fingering's all the same, the pipe length is all the same. Um, and it's basically just comes down to which notes are easiest to um, excite in the bore of the two. Because a trumpet bore, trumpet bore is flat. It's like, uh, what do they call it? Cylindrical. Trumpet bore looks like this, and then it widens out at the end, at the bell. And a coronet bore is like that. The coronet widens out all along the way. So I think trumpets are a bit more sharp or kind of harsh, which means that it excites the higher, um, the higher frequencies that are allowed to form inside the trumpet volume. The higher frequencies give it kind of a brighter tone. Uh, and those are more readily excited when you have a bore that looks like this. And instead they dissipate when you, when you have a bore that looks like that. So, uh, why is it easier to overblow lower notes on a recorder than high pitch notes? Uh, probably because, I, that's a good question. So when you're playing a recorder, why is it that the low pitch notes, you, you excite the higher mode? It might have to do with the, uh, that, that I don't know. Um, I, I can pr throw out some guesses as to what might be going on. One of them could be that 
it's a low quality resonator at the low pitches. And so what you'll have is a setup where uh, the recorder, what are the frequencies that you can excite in a recorder? And you have the low frequencies that are, you can excite like this, and then the high frequencies you'll excite like that. And when you blow across the recorder, you're actually exciting a variety of different wavelengths. Um, and so, so this would be like the response, the response of the recorder, which has to do with its geometric properties, that maybe um, there's probably some envelope. What is happening? There's probably some envelope of response so that uh, certain responses are easier than others to get, you know, something that looks like this. So it's hard to get stuff that's way, way up here, like dog whistle type things. And it's hard to get stuff that's way, way down here, the low frequency stuff, but it has a preferred resonance region um, that has to do with the shape of the instrument. You know, I'm guessing here, but this is all um, physically motivated guessing. And so uh, if you blow too hard, wh when you blow through the aperture, um, you're actually exciting all these modes. So everything here is being excited. Okay, and if you, the, the question is, are you preferentially exciting, um, uh, causing vibrations in the chamber around this wavelength or around this wavelength? And maybe the faster you blow, the more you are exciting wavelengths up here, which means that it's gonna jump from this response up to this response. That would be my guess as to what's going on. So if you want to play a low note on a recorder, you can't excite um, the higher frequency stuff. So you have to blow with kind of a steady laminar flow um, with, that doesn't have a lot of turbulence in it because turbulence is going to do uh, start exciting oscillations that are up at these higher frequencies. And so you'll jump up to whatever the next note happens to be on that thing. That's what, um, uh, that, that's my guess as to what's going on. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, confused with wavelengths and frequencies. Well, wavelengths and frequencies are inversely proportional to each other. So if you have a long wavelength, that's a low frequency and a short wavelength is a high frequency. Let's see, so if you, uh, you're, the reason that different people sound different as well is that your face is a resonating cavity. So here is your face, you have sinuses. So you have a bunch of sinuses that are all over your face. Right, you got stuff back here and then you got sinuses up here and it's kind of on the sides. So your nose will be like this and here's your mouth. I don't know where all your sinuses are located, but I know that sometimes you, when you have a headache, it's up here and there's stuff like in the, kind of in the side of your nose. So you have these different sinus cavities. Those sinus cavities have different shapes. Uh, some of those, some aspects of those shapes are hereditary, right? People look like their parents. And so family members will sound similar to each other because their sinus cavities are, the, are similar in shape to each other because their faces, their skulls look the same or are similar. So what happens, you have a sinus cavity. So here is your sinus cavity. You can fit certain wavelengths in, uh, you know, certain wavelengths will oscillate in a sinus cavity better than others. So when you're talking, here's sound coming out of your mouth and vibrating your whole cranial structure, um, certain wavelengths will be are easy to produce inside your sinuses and other wavelengths are harder to produce inside your sinuses because your sinuses are a boundary condition and there's a certain speed of the wave that propagates from one side to the other. And so when you speak, all of these different frequencies are excited in your sinuses and then the sound comes out amplified that the timbre, the, your sinus cavities and like the structure of your skull uh, give you your timbre, the timbre of your voice, like what your voice sounds like. How you can tell one person's voice from another is because people have different shaped skulls, they have different shaped sinus cavities. So, um, and that's because the sound waves is going to resonate in those and certain frequencies are going to be amplified and other frequencies are going to be suppressed based upon how big, what are the wavelengths of sound that are propagating around in your sinus cavities. So what happens when you get a cold or something like that and your sinus cavities either swell or they fill with fluid is now your sinus has a different um, volume, has different dimensions. And so when you talk in this case, um, the sound waves, uh, different frequencies are amplified. And so you sound different when you have a cold. You can tell when someone has a cold because their head is not vibrating the same way that it was when they're healthy. So there you go. There's those kinds of sound waves. So what have we talked about? We've talked about sound waves. 
We talked about different instruments. Pipe organs are the same idea. Um, anyway, all of these things are have to do with cavities or systems that will resonate at certain frequencies. Okay, the same thing is true with quantum mechanical systems. So let's say that you have a wave, let's say you have a circle, like a hula hoop or something like that, and you get the hula hoop oscillating. So you take a hula hoop and you shake the hula hoop like this. So you're shaking the hula hoop, which means that you're gonna have some, here's the hula hoop, you're gonna produce some waves that are propagating around that hula hoop. Yeah, like this. So here's a wave that can propagate around the hula hoop. Well, the fact that the hula hoop is connected everywhere, you haven't broken it, means that you're forcing a boundary condition, that once you go from one location on the hula hoop and you travel around the circumference back to that location, these two values must be the same. Um, the amplitude, like the dis displacement from the nominal position to the current position must be the same at every point here. And so when you go around 2 pi in radians, you have to have the same displacement. Otherwise, you'll break it, right? If there's a difference in the displacement, then it'll be broken. So uh, you can have waves that propagate uh, around in a circle, and you can establish boundary conditions based upon, okay, whatever the properties are here, the same properties have to exist over here. That will give you... Um, oops, that's not what I meant to do. Well, I, okay, so that's one way to do it. So here it is at zero. You can also imagine um, a wave that looks like this. And you can say, all right, here is where I'm starting. I'm starting at this position. And then I go around 2 pi and I get back to this position like that. These are called periodic boundary conditions. So those are the, uh, one, once you force a condition, then only certain wavelengths are allowed to propagate from one place to another. There are only certain wavelengths are allowed to go from one location around to another. And so uh, that means that if you have a cylinder, cylinders will shake at certain rates um, chains that you're suspending from a, something and you can shake, you'll produce different shapes. Uh, and because there's a boundary condition, then only certain shapes are allowed to propagate from one end to the other. The same thing is true if you have a sp spherical, like a three-dimensional object, it will vibrate in certain ways. And so you get vibration modes or wave modes that satisfy the boundary conditions that every point in space, uh, when you go around the circumference in any direction, you have to meet back up where you started. And those are the electron orbitals. So electrons are quantum particles that satisfy the, the Schrodinger equation, which is a wave equation. So electrons are particles whose probability density must satisfy the wave equation, and therefore they must satisfy a boundary condition. And because you have a proton in a given location and an electron going around it, so here's a proton, here's an electron going around it, it has to satisfy those boundary conditions. You can't have some break in the probability of the electron being somewhere. It has to be smooth from one place to another. And so then the question is, okay, you have a central force. Here's this thing. It's being, um, there's an attractive force between the proton and the neutron. What are the waves that you can create? And the waves that you can create turn out to be um, the shapes that you get for the electron orbitals. Where you have a lot of oscillation, you have a lot of probability. Where you have a little oscillation, you have no probability. Or when you have zero oscillation, you have no probability. And uh, everywhere in between. And so the electron orbitals are the waves that will fit um, in a, around a three-dimensional central force object. So that is uh, when you have boundary conditions, those are the constraints that you place on something. So that's also why when you have, when you look at the spectrum of an electron, if you look at the spectrum from a plasma, you can get all wavelengths of light. So uh, here is my rendition of an atom. Okay, so here's an atom. You have bound states here. You can have something that exists. You can have waves that fit in this area. But if the energy, so if your energy is low enough, the energy of your electron is low enough, then you can transition from one energy level to another and go back and forth between all these things, but they're all discrete. And so you're going to get certain wavelengths that are allowed inside this well. So you have an electron bound to a proton, so it's got negative total energy because typically zero energy is what happens if you start out at infinity. So you got zero energy up here. If it's bound to a proton, you get negative energy. And once you have negative energy, then you have a bunch of boundary conditions that you need to satisfy. So you have a bunch of specific wavelengths or specific energy levels where you can exist. And you can only absorb or emit light that is a transition between these different energy levels. But if you raise the temperature high enough or you 
add enough energy to the system, then the electron gets out of the bound state and up into these excited, up into the free states where they can have any wavelength at all. And so this behavior is the whole reason that different elements have different um, spectral signatures, different elements show different spectral lines, uh, is because it's a bound state and so there's only specific energy levels where the electrons can bounce around and as a consequence there's only specific energies of photons that can interact with the system. Uh, which is exactly the same thing as that you can have, if you have a free string with that's not bounded on either side, you can oscillate it at any frequency, but as soon as you bind it up, then you know you establish these conditions, then you can, then it restricts the number of oscillations or the variety of oscillations that you have on that string. And you can only transition from one to another, just like a bugle can only transition from one note to another. So there you go. What happens if the boundary conditions change over time? That's a great question. So you can have, um, you can have a loose knot, for example. So if the boundary condition changes, you can oscillate. Uh, well, I'll give you an example. So suppose you have um, one rope. Here's a thin rope that comes in and attaches to a thick rope. Uh, what will happen is you can send a wave along here that propagates it with certain properties, but it might not be able to move this rope. So this rope acts like kind of a combination of uh, a fixed and movable. Like some fraction of it is fixed because it moves with its its impedance mismatched, so there's resistance to uh, resistance to the motion of the wave through here. That's uh, properties of that particular rope. There's other resistance to the motion from this rope over here, the thick one, and so because it doesn't smoothly transition from one to the other, you'll get a reflection off of this. So the sound will come in, it will bounce off of that and reflect back. You will get some disturbances that propagate along here, but it's going to be a different amount. And so a wave will come in that looks like this, and a wave will reflect that looks like that same wavelength, and a, a wave will transmit um, down this other one. But the relative amplitudes of the reflected wave and the transmitted wave is related to how easy it is to transfer the energy across this boundary. So you have to match the impedance. Um, it's not exactly what, you questioned, what your question was. If you change the boundary conditions over time, then you can, um, like if you take a string and you lengthen it or shorten it, then you can change uh, the note that you play. It's kind of like the the bass, the, like the kitchen band where you have a, a mop and a pail and you have a bass that's a single string and you can change the length of the string which is kind of like changing the boundary conditions um, or a trombone you can get it to slide from one thing to another um, and so it will excite if you're buzzing your lips okay so that's a good example if you have a trombone, you're buzzing your lips at a specific frequency, and then you change the length, then it will, um, you will preferentially excite the wavelength in the trombone that most closely matches the buzzing speed of your of your lips. So, but anyway, so that's you can continuously transform the boundary condition from one place to another, and allow waves to continuously morph from one wavelength into another. That's similar to what's going on here, where if you have an abrupt transition, then you get an abrupt change in the behavior. Like if you have an abrupt transition in the properties of the string, then you'll get a very, you'll get a separate reflected beam and transmitted beam. If you slowly change the width of the rope so that it matches, um, like locally, the rope is uniform in properties then you can more easily, this is called impedance matching, you can more easily propagate that sound wave from one end to the other. So to give you an example of impedance matching, one is that you want your exhaust manifold to match. Um, you have oscillations going on in the engine because you have, you know, the car is moving at a given frequency, so you're exciting sound waves preferentially at certain frequencies, and then that sound wave is propagating through the exhaust manifold, and the exhaust manifold has to exhaust out to atmospheric pressure, and so you want to match the you don't want to get, uh, let me say that again, you want to match the sound wave propagating out of the exhaust manifold to the, so that it couples readily to the atmosphere, because otherwise you'll get reflections of sound waves propagating back up. If there's all of a sudden an abrupt change in pressure at the exhaust pipe um, from inside the engine to outside the engine, if there's an abrupt change in pressure, then you'll get reflections and those sound waves will propagate back up through the engine block, or up through the exhaust manifold and back to the engine and can hamper the performance. So you want to put in stuff that will more effectively couple the pressure that builds up, the sound waves that build up in the exhaust manifold with the outside air. 
Another example of what this happens is bullhorns. So you're talking at a rally um, and you'll have a bullhorn that looks like this. You know, you here's the handle down here and then there's that. Um, and it, the shape of this bullhorn is specifically designed so that the small sound waves that are produced here can readily couple to the atmosphere. And so, so as a consequence, you don't get the reflections and the energy gets propagated more directly out of the bullhorn. The same idea happens when, when you're yelling at your friend and you go like this, you cup your, uh, cup your hands around because there you're taking, you have a small aperture at one side and a large aperture at the other side to help take the sound waves so that they don't reflect back into your mouth, but instead they propagate outwards. Um, or another way to think about, we'll get into it later, but diffraction. You have a small aperture with your mouth and you're trying to get sound waves out of your mouth. Um, because your hands are, because your mouth is a small hole, you'll get large diffraction and the sound waves will propagate outwards. Typical sound waves are <clears throat> like yay long or something like that, depending on the, the wavelength that you're talking about, depending on the note that you're talking about. But for um, sound waves that are in the audible range, you're looking at sound waves that are about a foot long. And so you have a tenth of a foot for your mouth. And so when the sound waves hit it, they spread out very rapidly through diffraction. But if you couple your hands to it, then um, the diffraction goes down and you're focusing the beam, focusing the sound, the beam of sound uh, more tightly. <clears throat> so that's kind of cool. Um, and there was one other thing I was going to say about this subject, and it was really interesting and it had to do with something amazing. Um, sound waves coupling and to do this and the uh, impedance matching and... Um, and I can't remember what it was, but it was great. It was too bad. Uh, it didn't have to do with space chickens. No, it wasn't. It wasn't space chickens. Uh, possible mimic quantum behavior in orbitals using macroscope models with all the force properties of protons and electrons. Is it possible to mimic quantum behavior of orbitals using macroscopic models with all the force properties of protons and electrons? The answer to that is yes. Uh, it is possible to mimic quantum systems with macroscopic objects. So. Uh, nanoparticles in particular you can do this with so like nanotubes and things you can set up quantum behavior um, you can cool something down you can cool a crystal down so that the thermal noise is really low and then you can get quantum behavior from that um, superconductivity is basically well that's superconductivity is still microscopic but um, but yes you, you can make macroscopic quantum objects uh, I, I don't remember honestly I don't remember I had it on the tip of my tongue and now I can't remember what it was that was uh, something related to sound and instruments, and and it was going to be it was going to be great. So, oh well. Hopefully, I'll be able to remember and bring it back um, at some point in the some point next time. Anyways, that's what I got for today. Uh, next time we will be talking about electromagnetism. We will transition now to one of the four forces of nature, um, and not just the responses of different media to forces, but in fact, look uh, at one of the quantum forces.